Psalms 119 and 165. Um, it's a simple verse to read, but there's a whole lot to it. It would take you a long time just to break it all down. We'll read that, let you be seated, and then we'll move on in our Bible study tonight. Don't forget, Thursday night is our interpersonal Bible study next door in the fellowship hall. Friday night is our youth night. Amen. Amen. We got a lot going on. There's something every day here at Souls Harbor if you want to be involved. Amen. If you're at Psalms 119 and 165, say amen. amen. Okay, can I get an apostolic Pentecostal amen tonight? Amen. I know it's Wednesday. I know it's hump day, but I'm telling I'm glad this is a day the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice in it. Amen. Amen. Are you ready? Great peace. Have they which love thy law? That 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 is hard for us to say because some of us are still of the mindset. I thought the law and the law one. Am I the only one that knows that? And nothing, nothing shall offend them. Lord, I need you tonight. I'm but clay. I'm but dust. You're almighty God. You know the end from the beginning. You, there's nothing hid from you. Lord, I pray, God, that the searchlight of your word, God, would go into the deepest recesses of our hearts and our mind and expose to us those things, God, that are hindering us, that are hurting us that are coming between you and I in a relationship that we could have. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Now, this, this is a very tough verse when you realize what it's saying because I, I remember as a new convert, and I know some of y'all just came in on flowery pathways of ease, living for God, and you, you're, you're so angelic and perfect. Yeah, you really didn't have to change a whole lot when you started going to church. But well, I was rough clay from the bottom of the pit, so to speak. And so I remember in my early years as a new convert, a saying that has helped me immeasurably. It did hurt, but it helped. If you're offended, you're carnal. If you're offended, you're carnal. How can we say that? Well, my opening verse. Great peace. Everybody say peace. peace. Have they which love thy law. Do you love his word? I like the ones that make me look good. I like the ones that give me something to say to my wife when she ticks me off. I like that one that gives me ammo when I got to go deal with my brother. That's a twisting of scripture. Great peace have they which love thy law and only some things. I'll be honest with you. When I first had to navigate this, it was almost obnoxious how many times it rang true in my life. Something happened and I'd walk around in my mind full of arguments, full of woe, ready to fight, ready to cut with another verse. Right? Am I the only one that's ever dealt with this? Am I, am I the only one with some human attributes that needs the, the great potter to kind of work on and get that lump out of it? It was easily upset or set on edge, the roots of which came from my inability to believe and know God as sovereign. I find that people that don't know God as sovereign struggle constantly. They can't believe that an amazing God would allow a trial to come into your life to improve you. Or that God would allow you to go through a struggle 
to help make you, to allow you to go through a fire that he may purify you. But yet everything I've just stated is in the word. The war of this concept of great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall bend thee has tapered quite a bit in the 30 something years that I've served God. But nevertheless, in all honesty, there's still some minor skirmishes from time to time. One of the greatest helps in this arena of our lives is the word of God. Matthew 5 and 9, which is our idol text. Blessed are the peacemakers. peacemakers. But don't end there because it's all going to make sense when you realize, for they shall be called the, that means something. James tells us in chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, but the wisdom that is from above, because we all got our own wisdom, right? We got our own four cents, common sense, and cool people. We all have our, our shtick. But uh, it's from above his first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. Hey, listen, if your attitude and your mindset is not low, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, what does that mean? God's no respecter of persons. Let me say this. There is no big eyes and little U's in the church. There's no seniority, extra special benefits. We're all laborers. If you're the greatest in the kingdom, you are a servant. How many said, I want to be used? But the moment you feel like you've been used, your belly ache and bark. The moment you don't get it your way, hey, hey, I had it with this. Without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Proverbs 13 and 10, I cannot omit, I have to insert here. Because it's, it's a simple concept we know, but we often don't think about it. But the word of God is so beautiful in giving it to us. It says, only by pride cometh contention. You're upset. You're ready to fight. You're pride. But what the well-advised is, is done. But the wisdom that is from above, James 3, those verses work together. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, giving us a beautiful admonition. Listen, how many, like, how many love holiness? It's our popsicle stick in the apostolic movement. Holiness, holiness. I believe in holiness. I, I believe it says that without holiness, no man shall see God, right? But do you know what's before holiness? Follow peace. With all men, not just the ones you like, not just with your family, not just with the ones that agree with you. Who knows what discord is? Look, we all don't have to agree. But the moment you open your mouth, the moment you have a complaint, the moment you're offended, the moment you get mad, and the moment you want to put your foot down, because there's a message coming when God puts his foot down, and you better be ready for that one coming down the road, especially if you're someone who likes to put your foot down and go, okay, God, it's going to be this way whether you like it or not. Hear me when I'm talking. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Peace is for, if you're not peaceful, if you're not a peacemaker, I don't care how long your sleeves are. I don't care how long your skirt is. I don't care how much God you think you got. If you're constantly contentious and everybody's got to navigate around your little feelings, there's got to be something about you. They can crucify you and you're going to keep your mouth shut. You may not agree with it, but it's what God chose. Are you hearing me? Because it says follow peace 
with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You can try to omit the peace, but you cannot. That's a comma, not a period. Looking diligently. You may not like to study. You may not like to read. You may not like to read your Bible. You may read your three chapters a day and check it off to get your bread chart done every year. But looking diligently, lest any man fail to wait a minute. Peace of God. Isn't, isn't that the most generous attribute of God? Because you can do anything when grace covers you. Oh, lest any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Without peace and holiness, you're you're woefully falling short of God's grace. And the defiling is of yourself. Blessed are the peacemakers. Let me say, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, Telemachus was a monk who lived in the early 5th century. In prayer one day, he felt God urge him, unction him, saying, I need you to go to Rome. Packed his bags, set out for Rome. And when he arrived, the city was just filled with people, and they all seemed to be heading in the same direction. And he asked them, Hey, where's everybody going? What's this excitement all about? And he was told that today there were gladiatorial games going on in the Colosseum. He was shocked, he was amazed. Christianity had been the official religion of the Roman Empire for decades, and people were still showing up to watch people fight and kill each other in the Colosseum for entertainment. With this, to make us ran to the Colosseum. Just in time, he looked in and he saw gladiators standing there about to go into mortal combat. And they were declaring, Hail Caesar, we who are about to die salute you. He was stricken in his spirit. He jumped over the wall, ran into the middle of the Colosseum, stood between two gladiators about to fight, and said, Hold on, in the name of Christ, forbear, which means stop. The crowd was angry because. Their entertainment was interrupted. Protesters began to shout and encourage those same gladiators to take their swords, and they shouted, run him through, run him through. Gladiator came over from the side and mercifully took uh, the handle of his sword and hit Timotheus in the summit, knocking the wind out of him and sent him sprawling into the sand. Melchizedek got up, stumbled back again between those two gladiators and again yelled, in the name of Christ, forbear, stop. The crowd again was furious. And they chanted again, run him through, run him through. Another gladiator came over and plunged his sword through the little monk's stomach, fell to the sand. Blood started flowing out and turned the sand a crimson color. With his last ounce of strength, one last time, Melchius gasped out in the name of God. The crowd of an estimated 80,000 people in the Colosseum went silent. Nobody moved. Slowly. First one man stood and left. And turn and look. All spectators emptied out of the arena. When the story of this courageous monk was heard by Emperor Horatius. The emperor permanently banned 
the games, and this incident became the last known gladiatorial contest in the history of Rome. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. There's a parable that deals directly with our heart and our treatment of those in the field of the harvest with us, our brothers and sisters. Sometimes people see another thing, but I want you just to bear with me, and I know I need to go quickly. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 19, beginning of verse 30, and follow along in the new version, and, and go to chapter 20, verse 16. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, Everybody say house, householder. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's a man, it's the head, the father, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. And he saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever was right, that shall ye receive. We're talking about harvesters, we're talking about laborers, we're talking about workers for the kingdom of God. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, all the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. Wait a minute, I'm entitled to more. They likewise received every man a penny. And when they received it, they murmured against the good men. Are you murmuring against God? Because you got a little time in? Are you getting a little upset because maybe things haven't quite floated out the way you reckon them? Saying, these have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us. Hmm. We don't like that. We start thinking we're somebody. Well, that's our human nature. Don't ain't nobody in here free from that spirit. Ain't nobody here free from. Well, wait a minute. I had dinner with with brother and sister so and so. I I, I got. I've been around here a long time. Bless God. I. These have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Listen to what they're saying. They have their plight, they have their complaint, and they, and they have their cause. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that as thine and go thy way. I will give unto the last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? See what happened there? That's yours. That's yours. Not mine. It's his. It's his. Is thine eye evil? Because I'm good? Because I'm willing to give someone you agreed for this, but because I'm giving someone the same as you agreed to, I'm being extra good to them. That bothers you? You're calling me evil because I bless somebody? Because I've given them favor? All of a sudden, wait a minute, you feel slighted or hurt? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last, for many be called, but few chosen. That's a lot of information right there, amen? And I can see how many might think this is all about money and it's all about work. 
But the central theme of this parable really is a warning against having a hireling spirit in the work of the Lord. A hireling is someone whose motive and interest in serving another is wholly for personal gain or wages. Basically, they become mercenary. Hey, I'm doing this because I expect this. Not because I love you, Jesus. I put my time in. I'm here. I'm showing up. Bless God, I deserve it. Right? In a biblical context, by definition, a hireling has wrong motives, wrong attitudes, wrong expectations of the master. And like when Job was in a conversation, the Lord was like, you're going to counsel. Or like Jesus says to them, you're going to call me evil because I'm good to someone else. They missed the point of what it really means to serve the Lord, to call him king, to call him master, to call him savior. You can't buy or earn your way into heaven till today, folks. You can't achieve a superior status over another. If that's your struggle, there's a heart issue. And so I'll say this. How many knows there's one God? How many knows you're not him? How many believes God is sovereign? There's hope for me to become a peacemaker. So I want you to pay attention tonight. Proverbs 4 and 23, keep thy heart with all diligence. I don't know how many times I've had things that should not have bothered me, bother me, things that made me mad that had no right to make me mad because my heart got to thinking I was something in God that I'm not or that I believe that I have a seniority or a say when it's his house, not mine. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Out of it are the issues of life. I got to keep my heart. I got to guard my heart. I got to allow the Lord to have my heart. Most of our issues, most of our struggles, most of our angst, most of things that upset us stem from our getting our heart out of line with our heavenly father. How can we recognize a hireling? How can we recognize if we've turned God into an employer instead of a savior by our attitude towards others? I don't like how they sing that song. Oh my God, they're clapping off beat. I'm guilty of this one. Can't they clap right? Can't they sing that right? I'm the, I, look, none of you struggle like pastor struggles. I, 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 you all, you all watch me over there, wherever I'm standing for church, and I'm out of my mind because I got to get over me and allow God to be the Lord of this house. Can you feel me tonight? Can, can, can we have some honest people? I, you know what? I want to be a peacemaker. I want to allow people to exercise their love for God and how they want to do it. Let me tell you something. I don't care how you paint. I don't care how you sing. The only place I can put my foot down is doctrine. Doctrine. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you think you're going to put your foot down and have a say anywhere, you can come to me about doctrine, but anything else, you better find your place again. Hear what I'm saying. Remember, just the other week, I don't know, it was last week or the week before, there's been so much going on. I talked about the two men who went up to pray in Luke 18. That was all about a heart issue. If you're coming in here, you thinking you're better, or you think you're greater, or you think that blank sinner goes away closer to Jesus than you because you think you earned something when it was given to you. As Jesus mentioned in John, on John 11 and 9, though there were 12 hours in the Jewish working day, from 6 in the morning until 6 in the evening, daytime represents the time we have available to work for the Lord. Are you with me in the parable here? John 9 and 41 says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. So your lifetime right now is that period of time. Are you working for the Lord? You're not employed by him, but I'm serving him. All that I am, all that I have, all that I can do, I want to work for the Lord because I love him. 
He loved me before I knew him. Are you hearing me? The master of the vineyard goes out into the marketplace four times in this parable to hire people. He does. Early in the morning, 6 a.m., the third hour, which is 9 a.m., the ninth hour, which would be 12 p.m., and the 11th hour would be 5 p.m. So when there's only one hour left to work, when the master calls those last laborers, you know what I'm saying? But he promises he will receive whatsoever is right. The amount owed to each and every labor is left up to the master to decide. Aren't you thankful for that? See, see, judgmental people, let me help you. Because if God judged how you judged, you'd probably already be. I, I, I know some of you look like you've been angelic from the moment you breathed your first breath. Some of y'all just got it all that in a bag of chips, but in all honesty, no. But when the evening was come, those that were hired first were actually paid last. Then, to seemingly add insult to injury, they received the very same wage as those who only worked an hour. And they began to complain. Ever get upset? I'll be transparent. I was, it was a ministry thing. I was working and I watched how I busted my tail. I'm, I'm young, you know, in my mid 30s and I'm busting my tail. I'm doing all this. And they come hand out the paychecks and forgive me, you know, I'm, I'm as human as you are and had to fix me. I watched them as they hand out checks and I looked over at the Joker next to me and I'll just leave it a Joker. Not right, they were probably absolutely wonderful Christian, but in my ignorant mind, in my human spirit, I watched how much they did versus what I did. I had already agreed to do the job for whatever that pay was. It had no, it was none of my business what they did for them. But I got sideways. That lets me know that even me, oh man, I'm, I'm a preacher. Read the Bible. I got a prayer life can get sideways with God if I don't guard my heart. The biggest, the biggest thing we need to do is, you know what, I need to have a heart right with God before I worry about anybody else. One of the most precious things you have in your life is an honest mirror. Because if you're getting upset and you're sideways and you're about to trash your walk with God or take off and get mad, let me tell you something, you need a mirror. And such were some of you. Just because this isn't the chapter that was you doesn't mean before that wasn't you. Uh-oh. Whatever happened to the great peace of they which love thy law, nothing shall offend thee. If you're offended, you're carnal. I don't know how many times I had to navigate that with my mind. And, you know, I do talk to myself in the mirror. You can call me crazy. I've had to chew myself out because my feelings got in the way of my faith. And I got upset about something that, you know what? That's none of my business. It's funny. We all want personal blessings that show us favor. We just seem to struggle if we see God do that for someone else. And somehow we develop a sense of entitlement and feel we need to correct the master. Well, let me just give you a piece of my mind. It might be your last piece. And you may not have peace ever again. Listen, the parable is really not about money. It's not about being a servant. And it's not even primarily about rewards. It's about our motives and our attitudes. That's what this is about. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Your daily walk with God, if you want to get on a place where it's fresh and it's vibrant, you better get your heart right and realize that everything you do, God is looking at your motive. He is looking at your attitude. <laughs> towards him. You, you, you're you upset at something? Go to him before you blow your life up and blow your legacy up and blow your future up and blow your family up and blow your chill. He's looking at our motives and our attitudes towards him and towards our fellow laborers in the harvest. He cares how we treat one another. He cares 
Even if, you know, well, they didn't hear me. You've damaged your spouse by what you're spouting out of your mouth. Hello? You've damaged your children. I remember not too long ago, I had a, someone pull me aside. You don't know how many times I came home and had to listen to my parents have pastor for lunch. You don't know how many times you... Get in the car and, man, I can't stand the way she sings that. Everybody in the car, every time they get up to sing at any time, it's completely damaged. Because you thought it was about you. And you never considered that God is so thankful to have them in the harvest. God is so thankful that they're in the household. God is so thankful to have anybody and everybody doing what they do in the Lord. God is so thankful. And my, <laughs> there's another one taken out of the gates of hell, living for God, doing something. And you're making it about you when it's about him. You know, I'll say this in all transparency. Ezekiel and I are pretty much polar opposites. I know how to do youth ministry. I, I, I got to the highest level on a, on a, on a church organization level. I'm a youth president. That, it's a, a lot of responsibility. Then I actually became a regional director over the Southwest United States. Over a lot of stuff. And then I'm, trust me. We don't do things the same. Thank God. You don't have to do it like me. Stay in the doctrine and do your thing. Do your thing. What? We're all laborers. I can't be in there and out there. I can't be in there and doing it. I can't do it all. We need more laborers. Why would you get mad at someone? Because they do it a little different than you. Thank God you're not by yourself. Thank God you're not alone. We're here to build the body, not cut it down. I heard a preacher the other day tell a story. You can go read it. Robin Johnston said it, and it's about the 70-year legacy of the UPC Church. And he said, but when I was a 16-year-old kid, by, I think it was his dad, gave him and his buddy a couple of hammers and go tear down his house. Because anybody can tear something down. I mean, what can you build? What can you build? We're quick to, we're quick for God to be gracious, generous. But my brother, sister, ah, uh, God, they're disqualified. Look at their life. I, I'm way more holier than them. I've been here. I got seniority. Don't bless them. Don't use them. Use me. We see disqualifications. Or, are you hearing what I'm saying? You have to say along with Jesus, Lord, your word and your ways are good and righteous. Mm -hmm. The disciples kind of missed it. One of the very next events recorded by Matthew in that same chapter is the mother of James and John coming to Jesus, asking for lofty positions for her sons in the kingdom. How many members reading that? <clears throat> verse 20, chapter 20, verse 21. And he said unto her, Wilt thou, she said to him, grant that these my two sons may sit with one on thy right hand and the other on the left in my kingdom? How many knows what happened next? All the disciples, they heard it, they had indignation. They got upset. The human spirit got in the way of the move of God. How many times have we killed the move of God by our human? How many times have we even stopped the blessings of God because of our human? We've ruined our own name, reputation, and legacy because we went off half-cocked because our attitude and our heart got sideways with an expectation of, I don't like how you're running the business, Jesus. Business is 
church. And it's about love. It's about grace. And it's about mercy. Matthew 20 and 3 verses 25 to 20 says, but Jesus called them unto him and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and gave his life a ransom. Does that sound like you? Where can I serve? Where can I? But even the smallest thing, where can I? Why don't we take right now? All our thoughts and attitudes to the filter this is the subject. Just let me get back that heart of serving. Let me erase that idea that I'm entitled, superior, or, I, or, or I'm something better. Let me find that place that, I, Lord, I'm a sinner. It just. Remember what the book of Proverbs reminds us about only pride, by pride cometh contention. If you're at odds with one another, if you're at odds with the pastor, if you're at odds with the church, I promise you, I don't know what the degree of between you and God, your pride's in the way. Well, we have to throw the Bible out. I'm going to keep the Bible and you can go. Painful but true. But with the well advised is wisdom. Um, peace. The disciples had wrong characteristics. Blessed are the peacemakers, not the prideful. Blessed are the peacemakers, not the prideful. What are we going to do? What are you going to do? As a host, as a believer, as an individual, when God brings and God empowers the same thing, the same thing. What are you going to do when new people start showing up and doing things? How are you going to treat them? They may do it a little different. They may do it totally out. They may. How are you? Are are you still in the body of Christ? Or are you now? You can do and start blessing them. They start getting involved in what's going on in weaponry. You're around here. You want to do something? Let's do it. I know we don't. Not everybody's not here, but if you want to do something right here, doing it. If you're sideways and excuse me, if your butt hurt and all that other kind of stuff, you know, there's. A, let me tell you what you need. You need an altar and get your heart right. Because if you think you're the only one doing anything around here, but you're not doing nothing because your butt hurt, trust me, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need bandaging. Maybe we you let us love you more. Let us let you know that we value, we care about you. But you have to understand something. You got to get your heart right. You got to get your mind right because when God does great things in the church, the question will be joyous or jealous, peacemaker or prideful. You have to be honest with what you become with what God's doing in the body of Christ. Because I don't know about you, I'm ready for revival. I'm ready to see God do great things. I'm ready to see more people come in and get the Holy Ghost. I'm ready to see healings. I'm ready to see. I'm ready. See, I'm ready to teach more Bible study. We want 10 more lacings. We want to see more labor just like Jesus did. No matter. They may pick the cotton different. They may pull the apple. I don't care. Let's get laborers in the field. And if we all work together. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day. Oh, I don't want to be jealous. I want to be joyous. God, do a great work. Bring some more in. Give us more. Pro Let's get the building another building. Let's get the fix in the parking lot. Let's get more young people. It's not God's move. It's your move. We've all heard the parable of the prodigal son, right? That's really not the right title. Y'all get ready, so I'm fixing to teach right in your lap. Because that's an easy lesson. 
easy to point the brand new sinners coming in and God delivers them from drugs and from alcohol and whatever, all that figure, all that junk. It's quite difficult to sometimes see the jaded and bitter heart of those that never left the building but are upset. Because it really should be called the parable of the prodigal son. Remember why Jesus told this parable in the first place. Pharisees and the scribes murmur, saying, this man receives sinners and he did it. But why are you always taking people out? Why are you always eating? I'm still trying to be like Jesus. What? There's nothing greater than to sit down and break bread and just listen to the amazingness of someone brand new. I don't know about you, but I'm still waiting. I want to meet you. That's great. I, I'm ready to meet. See, I, 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 I don't want to be a soul winner. I want to be a friend of sinners. I want to let people know that we got a wonderful Savior around here and a God that loves you and you're your mess and you'll all that. Come on in here. This is the house of God. You'll be loved. You'll be expected. But we don't allow people to sit around going, well, they need to do this and they need to do that. I mean, remember the story of the Pharisee that wanted Jesus to come eat at his house. I taught this about a month ago. Jesus saw it. He said something to the man. I have somewhat to say unto thee. I might have something to say to you tonight. He wants you to learn something. Because he loves you. Hear me? And he goes on and he tells him, because the story that goes on in seven, chapter 7, verse 44 through 50, and he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, it's the point that Simon, if thou this woman, I had entered into your house. Oh, here it is. It says beautifully, you will hear between the lines about your house or his house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. She hath washed my feet and wiped them with the hairs of her head. See, 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 when it's your house, you won't do it. But when it's his house, anybody can come in and wash his feet. Oh, God, tell me, let me tell you something. This is not your house. This is his house. And we all need to let him come on. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet, my head with oil. Thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved, this is a place to come and love the Lord. Love much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now it's not that he wasn't forgiven a lot. We live for God for a while, all of a sudden we forget how much we've been forgiven. We forget the blessings. We forget how much is done. And all of a sudden we think that we're uh, in charge instead of in the harvest field. Are you hearing me? And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee. Did what? Did what? Great peace have they which love God. Amen. I believe that peace not only went with her, but I believe it left with her. And Simon was left with bitterness, entitlement. Probably lost. So let's get let's get in Luke 15. We're given the parables of the lost sheep, coin, and son. I'm going to be closing out with this. Let's look at the end of these parables. How many know those parables go in succession? Okay. And I've taught on this, so I don't need to be ready to point. But it says, now listen, I want us to get to this because we kind of skim over this because we're so glad about the prodigal that makes it back that we miss the story of the prodigal sitting in the seats. The prodigal that never left. Now his elder son was in the field. Come on. And he came and drew nigh to the house. It's beautiful if you can hear it. 
and heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. I mean, it's a sad thing if you don't understand what's going on in daddy's house. If you don't understand what this house is for and what this house is about, yeah, you, you, you're an outsider. It's time for you to come in. And he said, and thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Ready? He was angry. I'm out of here. But in my times, when my idiot self and my flesh got in the way. But this parable is written, it's just like Jesus. And it said, therefore, came his father out and entreated him. They were both prodigals. They were both. One was physically and one was spiritually gone. To entreat is to call near. I know we, we, don't, we don't have any sinners here tonight with a bunch of believers that have been in our and their God sometimes has to look at us and say, hey, get back close to me. I love you just because I'm celebrating. <laughs> it's difficult to realize that according to this parable, 50% of the problems are those in-house issues. Father had to deal with the wrong attitude of the soul called Good son. Mm. The elder needed to repent of his attitude and return to the father's house just as much as the younger did. Maybe different reasons, but they both needed the father to say, you're welcome here. How wonderful and beautiful it is that the young prodigal met the father before he met the brother. Oh, that's a message in and of itself. Is, is it a dangerous thing for brand new people to meet you and your woe and your complaint and your bitterness because you forgot the purpose of the Father's house? Listen, I'm going to get some details here. He had nothing to lose by his brother's return. problem is, is he became too high and mighty and protective over what was his father's and not his. It's not ours until it's over, folks. It's his. He was trying to assert the father's will for the house. This is a place of acceptance. This is a place of love. I get it when you're out there doing your thing, but you got to get in here. We will celebrate. We will party. We will worship. We will dance. We will shout. We will sing the songs of the redeemed. We will preach and we will teach and we will love it here. You will not turn this into a place of your personal judgment. From the casual observer, he seemed to be doing his father's will but he was not right in his heart. On the outside, he had the right holiness. He looks like he was doing the right things, but his heart was wrong. He became a hireling. He thought he could replace and even question his father's choices. Hey, things are going to change now. I've earned the right to tell God how to run his house. The house was no longer about the father. It was about him. You ever notice people when they're going to have a baby, what they do? They get all those protective things on the plugs. They change everything. And it's no longer about them. It's about it's about the babies. It's about the newborns. It's about the harvest. Some of you need to quit being the babies and become the harvesters. It's about winning. It's about loving. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
This, this, this elder son began to think that his ways were as pure and as lofty as his father's. But the thing is, is he had a heart towards himself instead of a heart for the father. His, the fact that his father had to entreat him lets, lets us know that, listen, we're not on the same page here, son. You missed it with all your activity. You missed it with all your holiness. You missed it with all the rules. You're not at peace because you're angry because you've missed what this is about, son. And he was losing out on a relationship with his father because now he's upset and unjustly questioning and going to God. I don't want anything to do with that. In essence, one prodigal left the house and wasted his inheritance, and the other prodigal stayed in the house and wasted his inheritance. In all these years, yes, he'd worked hard, but he never once really understood Father. He couldn't understand the celebration. He couldn't see or understand the point of the Father's house. He forgot the point of his Father, the church. I can hear him throwing that tantrum, getting mad, spitting and chewing about all his rights and how he's got a right to say this and do this. And as of right now, with all that going on, the Father's now trying to reach to him through all his messed up thinking, and twisted heart. So the father gets out of one predicament that steps in another predicament with the one that never left. The children are cheesy. The father's house was in a paradox because his eldest misunderstood his will. And the party and the activity became a problem. As long as he's there. I've been doing all the work around here. I'm the oldest. I have seniority. I want things done to please me now, Dad. I want to say how things are done around here now. He's gone and come back. He got no rights here. I'm the one who stayed here. Look at the calluses on my hands. Look at the hours and the time spent. See those? They're from working in this church and working on this ranch and working on I got rights here. I was here the night he left. I was here when my brother told, told you that he's done doing the work for you. I heard him say things about my father being out of touch. I was here when he walked away. I watched him walk down that road with the inheritance in his bag. He wouldn't even look over his shoulder at us. I've been here working and watching seasons come. Seasons have gone. I've watched people come. I've watched people go. I was here and I heard dad cry. Tonight. And I knew what he was crying about. That I stayed here. And now this guy shows up because he's hungry, because he's hurting, because he's in need, because he's run out of money, because he's run out of friends. Because he's run out of food. And now he's come to sponge off you again, Dad? No! I ain't going in there while he's there. Send him out. Send him away. Can you hear your hidden spirit? Can you hear your attitude? Can you hear the anger and the bitterness? Granted, the younger probably did not come home for the right reasons. Left hungry, poor, and tired, and messed up. Agreed. But that's not the issue. There's something that trumps that. And I know every one of you from the oldest to the youngest can understand this. There was one thing the elder prodigal son just didn't understand. There is something that no matter how much you've done for the Father, it's his house and we are all his children. So do you have any, listen to me, do you have any idea what goes on in the heart of a father when he thinks that his child was dead, but he shows back up alive? Yeah.
Can you imagine? Can you imagine a father that has got his son back after thinking he's been dead? Can you imagine the moment you step in heaven and you find your love? And I thought, you're you risking to lose that because you don't understand what the house of God is for? Can you imagine that father when he's able to hold on to hug his son that he thought his imagination went wild probably with how many ways he could have been killed or been done in and never seen it. And to see him coming down that dusty road and the embrace it, we reckon, can you imagine it turning around looking at his church? You're mad? I'm upset because I want to do something for them. Oh, God, that we get a vision for the church like our Father does. If we get a vision and an understanding, get my heart right, my spirit right, and become a peacemaker. Luke tells us, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented more than over the 90 and 9 just person. <laughs> there ought to be joy in here. Thank God you can come home. Thank God you can come home. Stand. Can you imagine all heaven rejoicing? over someone that could have been lost being found, over someone that could be out there doing drugs. Instead, they're in here vacuuming carpets and painting buildings and all heaven's rejoicing and you're upset because they're not doing it your way? There's a party and you don't want to be part of it because it's not for you? Listen, both sons. One prodigal was rebellious and the other was religious. But what does the father really want? Relationship. You're stuck on rules, they're stuck on rebellion. Church is about relationship. We want to help you build a relationship with God. That's what we're here for. Come on in here. If you want to mow the grass, mow the grass. If you want to paint it, come on. It's about building a relationship and finding that place with God that I love serving the Lord. He loves me. I'm in a relationship. That's why I do this. The eldest was actually in greater danger because he was willing to miss the celebration over the pride in his heart. Pride is expensive and there's no one that can afford it. Blessed are the peacemakers. I get it. The younger was indeed rebellious. But the eldest brother was only following the rules and had lost out on a relationship with his father, and they no longer saw, saw eye to eye. But the, young, the elder sure felt that he was doing everything his father wanted, but he had lost out on a relationship, and now demanded, get rid of that one. I'm here. I get, it's all about me. He had holiness, but not peace. He caused trouble and was willing to sow discord into the father's house. He was willing to watch the brand new ones die so that he could be more important. He was unforgiving, he was unloving, and he was definitely not a peacemaker. If you've been in church a while, be careful. You have my have relegated the livings for God as a simple set of rules that you've lost the relationship. You may have questioned God, questioned his word, got mad, spouted off. Hello? I'm here tonight to let you know that God will restore a celebratory relationship with you. 
Psalms 118 and 24 says, This is the day which the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Psalms 122 and 1 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. you got to restore the joy of the Lord and get back. This is the Father's house. We've come to celebrate. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And then one of the biggest failures makes a statement in Psalms 84 and 10 and puts things in perspective. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. You want to live a long time? Live for God. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of, he doesn't say the Lord. My God, see, when you're willing to do anything and be a peacemaker, a peacemaker, a make. You'll do anything. You're so busy doing God's will, you're not thinking about putting your foot down. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. I'd rather, oh, my, my iPad keeps taking me back to the beginning, so I'm going to have to, the update messing me up. Let me get this. I want to read this to you. I'm done. But let me read this to you. Jesus. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Everything. Are you hearing me? Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look in diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I don't believe it's a coincidence that Jesus called those peacemakers the children. The children. It's your house, Lord. I may be a son, but I'm even going to be a doorkeeper. I'll pick up trash. I'll sweep the parking lot. I'll teach the Sunday schools. I'll teach the Bible. It's not about me. It's about you, Lord. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God.